Okay, so by my phone, it's 10 o'clock, so we're going to get started. I hope Karen's going to be able to join us, um, but I know we have a lot of ground to cover. So for those of you who don't know me who are in the room, I'm Senator Rebecca Ballant, I represent Wyndham County. I'm the chair of this committee, Representative uh, Mike Yachachka. Yachachka is the vice chair, and we are going to start off with um, 15 minutes of public comment. So I understand there are some folks here who um, wanted to testify before the committee. So who are those folks? Yes, great, okay. So we'll start, we'll go one, two, three. Okay, come on up, state your, yes please, and state your name and who you represent, and if you're a private citizen, that's fine too. And um, we are here to learn. So, yeah. yes. Good morning, my name is Roseanne Canizero, and I'm the Executive Director of the Vermont Youth Orchestra Association. I'm happy that this committee has been formed and is taking the time to explore the sustainability of community media centers in Vermont and I thank you for the work that you're doing. I ask that you work to find a solution to keep community media strong and viable for the future. The Vermont Youth Orchestra Association, or BYOA, enters its 56th season this September, and with that, there are nearly 2,000 individuals who call themselves alumni. When asked what is a favorite memory or highlight, uh, our musicians and alumni respond that performing at the Flynn Center for, for the Performing Arts is one of the most important experiences for them. However, for many of these musicians, their families or extended families do not live close enough to attend these concerts. This is where our partnership with Burlington Educational Access Channel, RETN, has played a critical role in making it possible for us to share this experience with our musicians, families, and friends across the U.S. and internationally. RETN recorded its first Vermont Youth Orchestra, or BYO, concert in 1998. This past May marked the 95th performance it has produced and shared with the community. On average, 18 Vermont community media centers carry each concert that RETN shares. I consistently encourage patrons before every concert to sit back, relax, enjoy the performance, and visit RETN in the following weeks to enjoy a high quality professional recording. Filming an orchestra concert with 70 to 80 musicians on stage is no easy feat. High production values and their use of multiple cameras allows for the viewer to see our musicians in action. We are the envy of many young, uh, many youth orchestra organizations across the country when considering the quality and viewing possibilities available to our families and community members. If not for this media partnership, the last 21 years of coverage would have cost the BYOA an estimated $250,000 to $300,000. Imagine for a moment the value this brings to the BYOA in visibility and public perception as a professional youth music organization. Directly, our musicians access these recordings for their college, conservatory, and summer program applications on an annual basis. I mentioned earlier that family members for many of our musicians do not reside locally. The ability to view online has expanded viewership by our musicians' families throughout Vermont, the US, and across the globe. For example, family members in England would regularly view their granddaughter's BYO concerts online. This past May, when they were attending her final BYO concert because she was graduating, they mentioned to me with tears in their eyes how lucky they felt that they had been able to hear her all of these years, even though they were so far away. Our partnership with RETN not only benefits our families, but community members from across our region who appreciate and enjoy the arts but are unable to attend, for example, a Sunday concert at 3 p.m., especially in the winter. We are proud to play a role in RETN's arts programming and to showcase some of the finest young musicians in our region. RETN makes it possible for us to share our talented young musicians with these communities, and this contributes to a thriving local media ecosystem. Thank you for your time and allowing me to share with you today why the BYOA so values our partnership with RETN and sharing our musicians' talent with community media viewers across the state. Thank you, thank you. So, Rosanna, sure. that, yeah. um, I want to make sure that folks um, on the committee have an opportunity to ask questions, sure. if that's okay. Sure. Um, I'd love to start just by, if you could um, reference um, this partnership with RATN, you feel like saves uh, the BYOA $250,000 to $300,000 
oh, this past 21 years. Thank you. In, okay. well, in the aggregate. Yes. And so can you just break that down for us? Like, how are you calculating that value? Sure. sure. So we do four concerts a year mm -hmm. at the Flynn. They probably bring in three to five staff members. Okay. They're manning, man, uh, I'd say, four cameras. So we're getting different angles on the stage. Um, so they're there probably about 9 a.m., 10 o'clock, setting up. And then they finish up. Our concerts go till they start at, we're out by 5 o'clock. So by the time they close up, so that's over eight hours of it there. Mm -hmm. And then I will always have a staff member that goes down and they'll do post-production together. So to make sure that certain portions where that those right camera angles or camera spots are on the, the appropriate musicians at that point. So, and that I'm not sure how many hours that can be, you know, a couple mm -hmm. hours of post-production for my staff. Yep. I'm not sure for them. Mm -hmm. So I would say that in recent years, it's been anywhere from twelve to fifteen thousand dollars in, you know, estimated sponsorship mm -hmm. through this partnership. Great. And that's probably a low ball price. Mm -hmm. I would assume that it acts. Well, it years. really is. Twenty-one years, you said. Twenty-one, 21, 21 years. years. So since nineteen ninety-eight, and um, I would say, I mean, they're refined. That they're really. High production, high, high, yes, absolutely high quality. Um, the way they're doing the camera angles, it's very similar to watching a symphony orchestra on PBS. You know, it's the very same idea, mm -hmm. and that idea of looking at the score and making that connection, which I, you know, probably in '98 wasn't being done. Right. And they have really refined with us and refined that over the years. Yeah. Is it recorded and then sold? Like so a, they, streaming? we were very careful about licensing. We make sure that the pieces are public domain. Mm -hmm. If we are using rental music, we make sure that we are paying for that extra licensing to have it distributed. They will distribute it to area community media centers, but also I've heard of channels out in the West. You know, they'll pick it up and pick up our concerts as well. Um, we don't handle that, but usually if there's a student that's asking for a particular, yes, they will pay something, I believe, to them to get like a recording, a DVD of it. And is it streamed online? Well? Yeah, yeah, that's how all of them are watching, which that's is, really neat. I mean, what a change. I, I joined the organization in 2012, and this is how our families are accessing this. The online has really been an important thing for all of us. Pretty great. Thank you. Thank you very Thanks much. Can you look the next person to sit so my camera can see them? Is that all right? Sure. You're going to do that. that. It's just that we are probably, um, Mike Grant is recording. So if we bring this mic over, you sit here. Okay. If that's okay, we'll move Karen Horns. Uh, name plate out of the way there. That's a good suggestion. Thank you. Bring that over so that it's recorded. I would never purport to take Karen Horn's place. <laughs> Uh, my name is, thank you for having me. My name is Bill Fraser. I'm the city manager in Montpelier, have been for 24 plus years. And, I'm, and ironically, I'm on the board of directors of the League of Cities and Towns, but not wearing that hat today. Um, I, too, thank you for taking this up and can't express the importance of the community media centers uh, in an era where there's a lot of distrust of government. Um, we find this is the best way to put ourselves out there. We broadcast all of our city council meetings, planning commission, development review, design review, uh, any special forums that we have, school boards, uh, various committees, and we find that, um, oh no, Karen, I'm in trouble, I'm in your seat. Um, and we find that um, it is our way for, for our citizens to know what's going on, and they count on it. That's okay. It's you, it's fine. Okay, Bill. Um, you know, I'm surprised anecdotally. I'll walk down the street all the time. People say, you know, I saw you on TV or I watch you. And I'm like, you know, I'm here. I know what's going on and I'm bored. How, why are you doing watching this on television? But they are because they're interested and they want to know what their government's doing. And it's just crucial. In fact, it, the feedback we get over the years, you know, when I first started, we had one camera and one mic and it was, you know, now we have split screen and 
all this kind of thing. And people are still, you know, they want better production value. They want to be able to hear better. They want to be able to see better because they want to, to know what's going on. So, I, you know, we live in a world where information is king. We live in a world where people want to know what's going on with their government. And this is essential to us. So I, I would urge you to do that. We, we feel we can do even more with it in the future. But for now, we are, we are broadcasting everything we can think of and then some. separate broadcast that folks can watch like on your website or is it like live I know a lot of local communities around the, the nation are you know starting to implement that kind of audio video equipment so they right just so we have a split screen we have a split signal so it's broadcast live on cable and also streamed and then it's archived so you can watch the, it later but it's all with the setup with the local cable so it's okay, so you can watch it now doesn't do it independent no, we, we own, uh, you know, Rob's here. He can probably correct me if I, if I get it wrong, but we co-own some equipment with them. We work very cooperatively with them whenever we have technical issues. I mean, they're right across the street from us, so they can come right over and help, you know, if, if something goes wrong in a meeting, they're there the next day to correct it, and a uh, very good partnership. We pay for the camera operator that, that night, um, but otherwise it's a shared arrangement. Yes, but not super recently. In, in about 2009, we did a, a community survey, and I think we're planning to do another one this year in ge with a lot of general questions. It's, uh, and one of them was, where do you get information? And it was a very high percentage. I don't remember the exact number, but very clearly people were watching on cable. So we pay an hourly rate to the, the person who comes and sits and, you know, unfortunately some of those meetings can be pretty long, um, but, uh, and that's a set rate, we pay them directly, um, we have their name, but uh, ORCA helps schedule them and we will contact them and let them know, you know, we have four meetings this week and here's the times and here's the locations and they will, we, we coordinate with my office to get someone there and then we, we pay them the, the, the technical production costs we don't pay for that's part of uh, what they provide and I think that might be an unusual arrangement that the municipalities cover the labor I think in most access centers the access center the cable subscribers cover the labor so this is an interesting okay. model okay. Um, to be looking at I, I don't know how that started but I think it we were one of the first to really expand you know, you know, a lot of people had their select board meeting or city council meeting, and that was kind of it. And we, back in the 90s, and wanted to put everything on, and so we said, hey, we'll pay for it, but we want to we want to provide this. And now it's, you know, once you do it, it's an expectation. So, and and we're happy to do it. It's a it's a good thing. Well, thank you for your time. My pleasure. Thank you for doing this, and I, I hope we can keep this as you know, transparency in government is essential. So, thank you. after watching till midnight your first meeting. <laughs> uh, my name is Tom Chamberlain. I am a resident of uh, Rutland, Vermont, where I have a private practice in family mediation. I have been a producer of a show on Peg TV called The Relationship Toolbox for the past two years. Having worked as a counselor and a mediator uh, with families, children, and employees for over the 40 some years, I have been struck with a lack of communication skills uh, in our society and skills for dealing with conflict. By the time couples, parents, and employees reach mediation services, um, it's often late in the game to begin learning some of the conflict resolution skills. Two years ago, while visiting the PEG TV studio in Rutland, the development coordinator approached me and act, 
asked me what I did for a living. When I explained, she seemed very interested and went on to inquire whether I would be willing to produce a television show on these skills. When I explained to her that I was very interested in uh, public education, but that I had no idea how to produce a television show, she was very reassuring and told me, don't worry about that. You will learn quickly, and we will help you. With that encouragement and the technical expertise of PEG TV, I produced our first show in April of 2017. Since that date, we have produced 20 shows dealing with the skills for building positive relationships with intimate partners, skills for building relationships between parents and children, and skills for building relationships with colleagues in the workplace. We have had parents, teenagers, young children, lawyers, and mediators appear on the show. Currently, we have airing a doctor uh, on our show who is talking to our audience about the communication skills we need with our care providers. Because of these shows available on PEG TV, I can now say to people if they want to learn more about ways to improve their relationships with others, excuse me, all they have to do is to go to PEG TV and uh, select the episode they want to view. I can't imagine what it would be like to live in a society where we would not have this kind of opportunity to educate others without the constraints of profit and regulation that govern commercial television. As a customer of Comcast, I am happy to pay a portion of my monthly bill to preserve the opportunity for public access to the airways. I am appealing to this committee to preserve current funding and support for public access, no matter how strong the pushback from commercial enterprises. So I, I have a question. Just, uh, do you have one? I, I do have yeah. one. Uh, yeah. that, that's, uh, are your programs uh, available to other PEG uh, stations in Vermont? I believe so. I don't know much about it. I don't know about it. I think this year, but I believe so. Um, it sounds like a very, very uh, valuable mm -hmm. uh, type of program. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, when you first went to the station, what was your, like, why'd you go the first time? Right, <laughs> yeah, no one brought you there. You stumbled into this. Uh, well, it was a little bit by stumbling into it. I saw advertised in the Rutland Herald, uh, an advertisement if you wanted to come in and do a Christmas greeting for people about what you do in the community, you were welcome to come in and do that. So I thought, why not? So when I went in, that's when they said, well, what do you do? <laughs> And that's the <laughs> got the yes. like, yeah. <laughs> yes. That's great. Did you have one? I was just going to say, we have a statewide program exchange called Vermont Media Exchange. So when your program is produced, it's then posted on this sharing platform. And access centers in Vermont take it down to run it locally. Mm -hmm. And in the case of the youth orchestra, it's also connected to a national network. So that can also be used by access centers outside of the state. So Lord Glenn, do they pay dues into the sharing platform to be able to be part of that network? Well, Vermont Access Network is a right. dues-based organization. So I'm part of that, that helps to support the platform. Yeah, and this might be a question for you, perhaps, uh, Lauren Glenn. Uh, do you have any idea what the viewership uh, numbers look like for your program? I've asked that question a lot because I'm curious about that too. I don't know. Do you have a participation, like a uh, participation aspect where people call in or something? Or is it more just outward education? No, it's outward education. We do hear from people in the community, it's small, so people come up and, and talk about it. And if they say, I saw you on television, of course, immediately I say, and what did you learn from? Yeah. <laughs> it's a really interesting aspect that you've brought here, Tom, that I really hadn't considered, which is, yeah. I've been thinking around issues of broadband and telemedicine, and the issues of how does somebody who's in their home, who doesn't have access to a therapeutic 
setting, mm -hmm. access that information. And so I, I appreciate you taking the time because I haven't thought about that aspect of what the value is to the community. I've been thinking much more through government meetings and tr government transparency is mm -hmm. what my, my lens was. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you to all three of those witnesses for making the trip. And um, certainly anyone in the room that knows somebody who would like to give public comment, please spread the word. We're going to start each meeting with 15 to 20 minutes for public comment. So I believe next up we are going to get a tutorial on PEG funding and access. And um, I want to thank Dan Glanville and Lauren Glenn Davidian for pulling this together because I know many of us are on a steep learning curve here. And so uh, this is a really important grounding that we need to have. And so I'm going to turn it over to, to Dan to get us started. Great, thank you very much. Uh, I have some handouts. I'll do those as, as I go through, if that's OK. I do have a question. Do we have to keep the door open? Do we have to? Is it an open meeting? I, I, They're all open in the state house. Oh, OK. Yes. Good. Is that OK? I just saw the door close, so I was curious. Oh, so. so <laughs> acoustics. Oh, okay. yes, yes, yes. OK, For excuse my ignorance. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So in the Vermont State House, every meeting is, is open. Unless Great. they're announced and it's going into executive session, which rarely happens in this building. Excellent. So, OK. I just wanted to do it for logistics, because in some jurisdictions, they're, they're Yes, yes. Um, people's House. Excellent. Okay. Great, so thank you very much. So uh, I know that we have uh, uh, a specific amount of time for these topics, and I'm going to give a general overview on uh, cable service. So cable service finds its origin under the Federal Cable Act, and where the provision was in that was basically the, use, the public use of the rights of way. Uh, and oftentimes, I describe that uh, people might not uh, realize it, but when you uh, actually go down the street, you see the telephone poles. Uh, they're actually in the public right of way, which is owned by uh, the local municipalities where we provide service. Uh, and franchising varies across the country. Uh, in some jurisdictions, uh, it's given to the really, in most jurisdictions, it's given to the states to determine how franchising will take place and what the local franchising authority is. Uh, for instance, in neighboring Massachusetts, the local franchising authorities are done at the municipal level. Uh, therefore, the franchise renewal and that process of granting use of the public rights of way is done at the local level. Uh, in other jurisdictions, it can be a shared uh, requirement. Vermont's a little bit different, but not different from many other jurisdictions in the sense that the local franchising authority is done at the state level. Uh, but there is a little bit of a quasi-local approach to that as well, because uh, the, the CPG, or the franchise, the Certificate of Public Good, <coughs> use those interchangeably, they basically mean the same thing, uh, has the uh, authority for then the negotiation for the PEG access contracts or the AMO contracts here in Vermont. And we do that uh, across the uh, jurisdiction with all the members of VAN. So AMO meaning? Access Management Organization. And those are the members of uh, VAN. We have uh, 22 of those, and there are others with other providers across the state as well. Um, so we have good relationships with all of them. But the origin also in the use of the public rights of way uh, goes back into the local franchising authority being able to assess, uh, based upon uh, cable-related needs, uh, what is uh, up to a 5% uh, franchise fee. In most of the jurisdictions where I operate, that franchise fee is predominantly used for public access, like it is here in Vermont. Uh, when I say uh, the future cable-related needs, what that process is, is it goes through a process of ascertainment as well. And when you go through the ascertainment process, it's really done during the renewal process, or in, in, in some instances here in Vermont, it's done when we negotiate specifically with the AMOs. And I'll get into some specifics of, of that in a moment. Uh, but in most jurisdictions, they actually do a little bit of survey work, where they survey the uh, local community members to determine what the future cable-related needs are. There's also a provision in that where you consider the future cable-related needs while considering the cost of meeting those needs as well. 
Uh, in some jurisdictions, uh, they have uh, they go up to the five percent cap. In some jurisdictions, they go a little bit lower than the five percent cap. And in some jurisdictions, uh, there is no uh, franchise fee. Uh, what we have in uh, what we have done in Vermont is we've negotiated with all of the AMOs. I'm, I'm pleased to say that all of the AMOs have been very active in the provision of public access. Uh, they've done uh, great work in what they do, and they consider they continue to be deeply involved in their communities. You know, when the orchestra was presenting here, and I thank them for the presentation, really that's just the key fundamental of what public access is intended. It's to bring that electronic soapbox into the house. Uh, and it's interesting how it's done that way to really bring that to people who can't make it out and see that. So it's really a good example of how 1501C3 is working with the AMO organizations to bring that into the house and to the enjoyment of some people who might not be in the jurisdiction as well. So we work with the AMOs, the Individual Access Management Organizations, and we are at 5% in those uh, organizations. I will tell you, since I've been involved in Vermont, we've never per se challenged that 5%. We've a, we don't have a desire to reduce that uh, percentage payment because we've recognized through our uh, research that uh, there is a strong element of support uh, for public access here in Vermont. Uh, and we Dan, continue. Can I, can I yes. just ask, um, do you find it is different in other, so you're also in Massachusetts when you say you find that there's local support here in Vermont, is it, is it a greater support than you've seen in other? Yeah, so it, that's a good question. And it varies because uh, I would say that in, in, and I'll say local franchising authorities rather than the municipalities, sure. it's easier for me to, yeah. in, in local franchising authorities where there is an established provider of access, you are more likely to see uh, people who, have, who recognize it, A, mm -hmm. uh, and then recognize the value that it brings to the community. Uh, so there are some jurisdictions, not here in Vermont, but there are some jurisdictions who primarily use it for government access. So you would probably get less of a reaction in regard to, to that request. I will tell you something that is pretty common in most of the jurisdictions is that there is a, a uh, recognition of access. Uh, and generally, we find, uh, I've seen limited instances where the statistics vary on this in, in, in my tenure. Generally, we find that people recognize it, they support its continuance, but when you ask the question of whether or not they'd like to pay more resources, which as you as government officials probably recognize, we often get a negative response uh, on that. Uh, but I think that's human nature. Uh, there, I have seen some jurisdictions where we have, uh, where we have seen a willingness. Uh, they do surprise me, uh, but uh, I have seen those. Uh, so 5% is there as well. We also have, uh, in many jurisdictions, a capital piece as well. Capital generally falls outside of the 5% uh, amount. Uh, in Vermont, the way we do that is we actually do that as a continued percentage. So you'll see some that will be 5.25%, 5.5%, which will allocate that, uh, that specific. And, and then sometimes in the AMO contracts, uh, we have some small provisions, uh, such as advertising reimbursement, which are, which are also uh, negotiated, and uh, which are uh, then remitted to the AMOs uh, throughout the uh, process of the agreement. So that's kind of a, a, a general history of how it happens. I, uh, it can be sometimes rather uh, mundane, so I hope that I try to uh, limit the description. I'll be happy to answer any questions we may have. Um, I can make this available electronically as well. I have Great. six copies of this, but I will make it available electronically. So if you would uh, email that to Mike. Yes. Front, and Great. Then he can post it right to our there's a page on the legislature website that has this committee. So Great. Can and this is all publicly available information that we file in our annual reports, so no big surprises here. Yep. We did enter uh, through our app. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, uh, I have a question. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that I understand. So you said that beside the 5%, up to 5% amount, that, um, that I guess is uh, provided by the FCC, you also have a capital piece that's a quarter to a half percent in addition that you remit, and uh, an advertising reimbursement. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Advertising reimbursement work. 
Uh, it varies by by ammo contract. It's it's a small amount of dollars, and what happens is Who's the advertising the AMOs will do some advertising during a particular year, advertising uh, on cable, uh, in, usually in newspapers. Oh, newspapers. Yeah, okay. and we reimburse for that. Uh, it, it was probably uh, probably uh, I'll, I'll defer to Lauren Lauren Glenn an opinion because it was probably more productive in the past to do newspaper advertising than it is today. Uh, but we they continue the process and uh, we continue reimbursing for it. Is the 2019 number uh, listed on the agenda? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no, I think that is through a little more than Q1. Yeah. I'm fairly certain. And I'm not going to go through, go through the details, but yeah. we entered in. It just jumped out at me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. It, so it jumped out as a. Uh, it, it might be halfway through it, but I think it's a little less than halfway through it. Uh, so you've seen that when we enter in uh, 2006 where we were and where we go through 2018. I know that I come up later in the process to discuss some trends. So uh, I can speak to what may cause some trends at that juncture. Uh, but this just gives a general flavor as to how the funding has taken place over that period. And I must say this is all funding, so this is not, this is, we can categorize this. Uh, I see Lauren Glenn squinting, so we can categorize this by percentage payment, yeah. by capital payment, okay. and also by advertising payment. Uh, my statistician, uh, Melissa Pierce, is the one who uh, puts all of this together. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, and that's what I have right now, but I will have some, I have some further information regarding uh, what look like EKGs on uh, the, the trending report and some general commentary as what affects trends as well. Okay. Yes, Clay. Can you uh, discuss a little bit about what revenues uh, contribute to this funding? Yeah, so good question. Um, cable service revenues include, are, are, are included in that. Cable service has a broad definition. Uh, it's generally the provision of our television service. It also includes uh, revenue from the rental of uh, cable service equipment, meaning the set-top boxes uh, and, and that type of equipment. Uh, in addition, there is a proportional basis of advertising revenue because we receive advertising revenue from our, uh, some of the local ad providers, which are included uh, in the cable service revenue as well. And what, how this is collected is that it is uh, collected on a monthly basis as a percentage of the cable service that subscribers pay. It's then uh, paid on a quarterly basis. Uh, most, most go through on a quarterly basis to the AMO providers. Did that answer your question, Clay? Yes. This is really helpful. Thank you. Any questions for Dan at this point? I have a question, but I think he's going to address it later on. Okay. So All right. So just make a note. If he doesn't, I'll get to it. <laughs> <laughs> so at this point, I will turn it over to Lori Glenn. Sure. I have a little more colloquial, colloquial history of um, cable in Vermont. Great. I think Vermont. Mm -hmm. And also, I wanted to uh, drill down into this question of community needs assessments and ascertainments as a driver for our budgets. So this is helpful because some of the numbers in my presentation are overstated, um, so I'm glad to have the actual numbers. Um, so as Clay was saying at the previous meeting, Vermont was one of the first states to have cable television in the country because of our terrain. And at that time, um, entrepreneurs, many people who want to sell television sets, think of that, or entrepreneurs in general, think of uh, Richard Snelling and Dr. Bajan in Burlington, set up cable systems so people could receive signals from the big cities. So at that time, the cable systems were about 12 channels. They were very simple systems. Um, and until the 70s, they really weren't, early 80s, weren't more than 24 channels. And then the 80s, they started to creep up to 36. And then um, a new order of technology came in. But I think what's helpful to know is that in 1984, when um, CCTV took up the work of public access. There were 50 cable companies in Vermont. And the biggest company at that time was Cox Cable, and they owned the biggest cities in the state. And um, a group of regional managers put together a uh, offer to buy up the Vermont properties and the Berkshire properties. Mm -hmm. And in 1987, is that my, is my numbers right? In 85, 85 yeah. yeah. In 85, they um, bought those properties for $35 million. 
And um, two years later, they sold it to Adelphia Cable for $113 million. Two years later? Yes. Wait, two and a half years. Two and a half years. <laughs> yeah, so so within two and a half problem. years, the value of the cable properties went from $35 million to $117 million. Thirteen. Uh, Thirteen. Right. Oh, sorry. No, that's okay. My, my number dyslexia is going to get to me here. Um, so it was pretty significant and it actually was, I think, I, I, just as an asterisk, it was a very important moment for us in the access world because at that time the Green Mountain Cable Partners were our hometown guys. They were local, they weren't cops, they were not far away, they lived here. They were very friendly, they were very helpful to public access, um, but then they were made an offer they couldn't refuse by Adelphia, and they had the fiduciary obligation to take that offer. So it, the cable industry can the market and the dynamic can change quickly, and we learned about this idea of fiduciary responsibility, that um, there is a fundamental financial case to be made in the business, and that, that as Peg, activists, we had to take that into consideration. So Adelphia, as you know, went on a pretty significant, you may not know, went on a pretty significant buying spree at that time. And they increased their subscriber base from 45,000 to 450,000 by the mid-1990s. <clears throat> they um, bought up many of those smaller cable systems in Vermont. And the properties that Comcast ultimately bought after Adelphia's Bankruptcy were the result of that consolidation at that time. So at this time, there's less than 10 um, cable companies in the state of Vermont, and that's the result of that period of consolidation. As the Department of Public Service points out, 65% of Vermonters <coughs> either have cable TV service or it runs by their homes. So the penetration rate is um, substantial and many Vermonters depend on cable and have depended on cable television to get their communications um, and their local communications and national. And as you can see here on page two, um, there are one, two, three, or five other cable systems that have PEG AMOs that serve um, their communities with PEG service in addition to Comcast, and that's Charter, VTEL, Burlington Telecom, Southern Vermont Cable, and Waitsville Communications. So that gives you a sense of the landscape of cable in Vermont. I'm sure Dan can also add um, to that. But the legislative and regulatory history, I think, is also of some interest, because it was in the early 70s that the Rand Corporation actually published a paper on public access television, 1970 and 1973. And I actually was not even aware of that until yesterday. Um, but the work of public access really began um, in Canada at the Canadian Film Board. And a man named George Stoney, who was a documentary maker, was hired as an executive producer to preside over a project where citizens were given what were then newly portable video cameras to use as an organizing tool in cities and rural areas to convene people, ask them what they felt was important for community development purposes, have a screening, everybody comes together, they see they have common cause, it becomes the basis of community organizing. So George Stoney, who was that executive producer, was so impressed by this that he took the model to New York University and he started the Alternative Media Center. And at the same time that he was training the first generation of um, activists with cameras, community developers really with cameras. Goddard had a community media center also operating. Mm -hmm. And so the first leaders of that time from the 70s were generated from Vermont and New York and they were sent across the country at a time when there was no federal requirement for public access. The FCC would include requirements for public access that it included, it be struck down, it included, it be struck down. There was this kind of iterative process until the Cable Act of 1984, which was an amendment to the Communications Act of 1934. And cable was in effect. It was created as a title, as given the Title VI. And the, um, I think, important thing to know about the Cable Act in 1984 is that a substantial part of the outcome, well, number one, the Cable Act existed largely because the cable industry wanted some um, continuity in franchising. There was this 
gold rush going on across the country where, where municipalities wanted cable, cable operators wanted to serve the cities. These incredible deals were being made, these incredible promises were being made, and um, it was in order to get the big, because the cities were in the last place to get cable, right? Um, the big cities, strangely enough. They already had reception. So the, the industry wanted some help in um, sort of reining in this process. And so the Cable Act was created in part as a compromise between the National League of Cities and Towns and the cable industry. And the franchise fee, the compensation for the use of the rights of way was part of that compromise. So I think that's an important piece to know. So um, in Vermont, Rule 8 is the state's articulation of the rules related to, that are controlled by the Cable Act of 84. And Rule 8 is um, essentially, I think we know, but I'll just state, gives the guidelines for what a cable <coughs> operator has to do to provide, get a contract, a certificate of public good to serve Vermont. And Rule 8.4 in that section outlines what the public access requirements are. And those were, we put that together, I think, in the, was the late 80s, early 90s. Um, and that, again, helped to rationalize this process that until then was done on a case-by-case -case basis. The point that I want to really stress here is that um, even before there was a cable act, there was public access. There were channels in St. Johnsbury and in Brattleboro. But even when we, CCTV, negotiated with Cox for the first channels in 1983, there was no cable act. So we were using precedent, so other communities that had public access, and we also were using what we still use today and is incredibly important, community needs assessment. The identification of community needs and interests as a driver for the resources to be set aside. So the channels obviously were important to set aside, but the budgets that outlined what the capital requirements were and what kind of operating support there would be has always been driven not on some number that we think we can get, but on a specific tie-in to what community needs. So this is done on an 11-year basis. There is a community ass assessment, ascertainment done. The department conducts it as part of a new certificate of public good. Comcast or the cable operators do their own research, and the access community does its own research. But in the intervening years, access management organizations conduct strategic plans, they do surveys, they they are always trying to identify if the services that, that they're providing are aligned with community needs. So I just wanted to point out um, the most recent, press home to unlock, and it's, oh, there's the numbers. Thank you, Mike, he's so good. He's very good. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, this year, conducted a, had the Center for Rural Studies do a poll for us, Vermont Access Network, so I just wanted to point out, this is a kind of um, statewide assessment in addition to the very granular local assessments that we do. So this, um, folks were asked, uh, have you ever watched public access television? And on cable TV, 61% said yes, although I think some of them might have thought they saw it on satellite because that was added in there. So mm -hmm. I think there is, I think it's important to note that sometimes people think public access television is public television. Mm -hmm. So sure. it's conflated in their mind, so it's not always easy to know what people are thinking. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a general awareness of public access television, and that's been backed up in other surveys, especially the one done for the most recent Comcast CPG. So Lauren Lynn, this is 2019? Yes, this okay. was in February. Have you ever watched public access TV for any of the following reasons? So there's quite a range. Municipal meetings, community events, election coverage, school events, and educational programs, and other local programs. So it's a pretty strong distribution of what people are interested in watching. It doesn't all skew to municipal meetings, although it's the one that we hear a lot about. 
And then this is the one that we, this is the question that we were interested in in particular. Do you think having public access to these programs and services is important, somewhat important? Or et cetera. And so there is the very important, somewhat important, the idea, as Dan said, of public access existing. Um, we didn't ask if, are you willing to pay more? But what we asked was, um, public access programs and services are mostly funded by a fee applied to cable TV bills, but this source could be eliminated or diminished. Would you support future funding through any of the following? So we were trying to get a heartbeat on right. what people. What are they willing to pay for the service that they say is by? And how? And, and what how? way? Yep. So local government budgets was seen as one way forward. State government budget subscriptions, which is an, an idea that we haven't yet fully explored. Local fundraising efforts, of course, philanthropy is a huge driver. Lauren, can I ask you a question on that one? Yes. Is it okay to interrupt? Please do. So it, could you, I presume then you could answer more than one. So that 262 is not limited to only being that. Right. Okay, thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. of these, right. It didn't right. add up to 100. So I think this gives just a, a, a kind of picture that again create guidelines for us to think about the work that we're doing. Mm -hmm. Is one of the reasons that the PEG study committee exists because we saw, oh, there's actually interest in mm -hmm. thinking about how state government might support this or to have a conversation on that level. Mm -hmm. um, in this document, which you can read at your leisure, there is a, just again, I wanted to refer to a more granular uh, strategic planning process that RETN conducted with VCAM in Chipping County. And we'll I have you on, question. I'm on page six. I have yep. a question, Lauren. Yeah. Um, who was polled? Who was polled? So yeah. the Center for Rural Studies, Vermont Data Center, did random phone calls of Vermonters during okay. a particular period of time. So not just people that you know watch. Exactly. Or, okay. yeah. so, follow up to that random, did they uh, do it statewide and uh, weight counties uh, or municipalities based on population? I don't know. Just curious. I, mean, just, I can I, ask them. We do go through their methodology if we can see a little yeah, bit lower. Sure. Okay. Oh, okay. Absolutely. Thank you. So. I just know that I, I live in a place that doesn't have cable TV. So, so if I were to take a survey, my answer is like, reflect that I don't have cable. Folks who are, who are videoing this, are you able to see that? Okay, great. So they did <coughs> a random sample for the poll was drawn from a list of Vermont landline and cellular phone numbers. So it doesn't yeah, sound everybody. like they weighted it okay. in the way you're describing. 680 responses. And these numbers conform to surveys we've seen before, there's nothing, there's no outlier on this. Lauren Glenn, did you have one more point that you were stressing? I want to make sure we don't yep. lose that. Yep. So um, on page six, uh, Jess Wilson talks about, she's the executive director of RETN, about their strategic planning. And again, I use the word granular because this is the 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 one-on-one -on -one conversations with users and community members that indicate how to spend your money what we need to do. We need, obviously, the one thing we always hear is you need to market more effectively. We're kind of like Shoemaker's Children. We have a TV channel, but people <laughs> need to know more <laughs> that we are there. Um, so that's, that's always what everyone hears. But um, what's interesting here was that some of the initiatives that they planned based on what they heard was the launch of a merged database for community equipment reservations, and virtual reality and 360 degree production education program. People were interested in that. They work with young people. This is a very important aspect of what they do. So on to PEG access financing. Um, PEG access financing is primarily uh, based on cable subscriber revenue and their contributions to the cause. There is an increasing uh, focus on business planning and revenue diversification among the access centers. And you can see here from the um, BCTV, GNAT, Okemo Valley even have sections on their website that say underwrite with us, become members with us. It is important to point out that the work that 
the PEG centers do actually supplement the budgets of the public institutions. So I think that Montpelier is, a, is an outlier. Most municipal municipalities receive deeply discounted or free coverage of their public meetings. So this is an offset to their public budgets. Educational institutions for whom RETN and educational access centers supplement public education budgets through the training and the education that they provide to young people as well as to older people. The nonprofits for whom their reach, as, as the youth orchestra just mentioned, this is a, a cost to them that they don't have to pay because these PEG budgets are supplementing it. Now, this is not to say that there is not a way forward to diversify the revenue and to increase earned income or fees for service, contributions, and underwriting. Um, but we know, given that these budgets range from about 50,000 to almost a million mm -hmm. between Hardwick and Rutland, that um, these larger budgets will be really hard to replace <coughs> using diverse revenue sources. Other, um, you know, the traditional ways. It will take a, a several years for these organizations to have a philanthropic base that yields two or three hundred thousand dollars a year. So, looking ahead, um, we are interested in thinking about ways to leverage the value that PEG offers. And some of the things that we have been thinking about include a statewide TV channel, reviving Vermont interactive television, services to the state, working more closely with the state government, services that we can provide to the state that amplify the reach and impact of what we as the state are trying to do. And finally, there were some questions about uh, internet statistics. So we don't have access to the cable, cable numbers. Like how many, we don't have the Nielsen's for the cable. That's not something that is made available to the PEG. So actually, since we've gone online on the internet, we've had a, gotten a much better sense of who's watching beyond anecdotal. And uh, I think the very short, there's details in here, Mike, that you can look at. But I think what's really important to know is that if there is a gun hearing, you know, gun rights hearing in Essex, you're going to have a thousand people watching that live. If it's a regular select board meeting, you might have 30 people watching that live. But the situational value for that to be there when those thousand people want it is how we measure the value of access. It isn't how many people are watching on Friday night at 4 o'clock or 10 mm -hmm. o'clock. It's how valuable and to what audiences are these niche programs and general programs of value to people. And in a community like Brattleboro, you will have as many hits on their website as you do in, in Chittenden County. Mm -hmm. So it, the size also doesn't really, of the community doesn't really matter. It has to do with the relevance of the services that we offer. And that's why the community needs assessments are so critical, because they assure that we can remain relevant and serve the people in our community. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, Lauren, so if I could, Karen, oh, just, no, it's okay. I just want to make sure that we don't squeeze the later topics. And so I'll take a couple questions here. Anyone, um, as I move us along, if your question doesn't get answered, please make a note of it. We'll circle back around at the end. I just know from my own morning committee that often the folks at the end get um, their time curtailed, and I don't want to do that. So, Karen, go I ahead. I think it's a quick question, but um, I believe that in recent years, some of the cable stations have added themselves to the list of charitable organizations at town meeting that you contribute to. I think that's the case in um, a bunch of towns recently. Yes. Do you have any idea what, what kind of revenue is derived from that? Kevin, is that a number that you are aware of? It's not offhand. Yeah, it's, it's a range. Yeah. You know, for example, in the case of Channel 17, we were receiving um, about $6,000 per community that we served between six and 12,000. Uh -huh. And when the, the gap, the reclassification of cable revenue happened at the end of 2017, 
we all took a financial hit, and for us it was about $48,000. So we asked all of the municipalities to ink to double their contribution. Mm -hmm. So now we're yielding about $90,000 in municipal revenue. I think that Brattleboro um, probably asked for something on the order of $1,500 or $2,000 mm -hmm. per municipality. So I think we have a range depending yeah. on the community, but you are right, more more of those requests were granted. Um, so I think that's a, an important question. Um, this is just cable service revenue, so you have revenue from other sources, and so being able to see, um, I, I'm sure you've already provided that, so I have my apologies. Um, kind of the total picture of revenue is and what the different sources are. I have. I really appreciate that. Yes, I have. Um, I didn't put it up, but I did bring just so you know, and I'll just send it around. We did a quick little survey of the um, who's raising money in different ways. So I will find that and pass it around. It's in my pile here. And then I just had one other question. Yeah. Um, for AMOs that serve multiple political jurisdictions or multiple communities, like Orca probably a good example. How are resources allocated between the different communities? As in, how do you make decisions about, you know, um, mm -hmm. recording and uh, streaming, or not streaming, but uh, broadcasting Montpelier and then Randolph and East Montpelier and the other communities? In um, the case of, um, I can speak for Channel 17, at town meeting television, we allocate resources based on the subscriber breakdown. So we get a subscriber, and that actually hasn't changed significantly in 20, 30 years, but um, surprisingly enough, but that's how we do it. So we allocate it based on the number, weighted number of subscribers. So they get, Burlington gets more resources than Essex. So a town that's in a franchise territory of Comcast, but Comcast hasn't actually built that town, so there would be zero subscribers. Would they then get zero resources allocated to their town meetings or their? We don't have that situation okay. in Chittenden County. Rob, is that? Did you want to add how you allocate resources? Sure. Rob, can you state your name and who you represent? Yeah, you want me to come up? Sure. Come right. Okay. Um, so my name is Rob Chapman. I'm the executive director of Orca Media here in Montpelier. Uh, differently than Laura Glendas, we do not discriminate on our towns. We serve 14 towns in Central Vermont, around Montpelier and Randolph. Uh, we try to uh, make sure that all the towns get services. We sort of have a basic line of we'll the select boards and school boards and districts. There is an organic sense of serving obviously more events, more community events in Montpelier than there are in, say, Worcester, Vermont. Which, uh, so we, we don't, we try to make sure, and my board often says to me, we have to make sure that we get the smaller towns, uh, the resources that they might need and serve them as just as well as we do the other towns. Thanks. Thank you. So if I could, if we take a moment and have um, Lauren Glenn, Dan, and Clay look over the five remaining agenda items and just let me know which of those topics do you think is going to require the most? Senator, mine won't require any discussion. I okay, think you're more just, just here's the map, okay. your, your own information. Okay. Happy to talk about it, but so at you, most a minute. Okay. Okay. Uh, the franchise fees on video providers in other New England states, I have a, just a brief update on that. Okay. And I think what I can do is offer also to bring in a guest. Okay. Uh, one of our future meetings that can give much more of a topical discussion on it. Great. That is helpful. I just want to make sure that we're allotting enough time. I know there, I assume there are going to be plenty of questions about the proposed FCC report and order that, that recently came down. So I want to make sure we save time for that. So I would love to turn it over to Lauren Glenn again to talk about capital funding over and above 5%. I wasn't exactly sure. <clears throat> I wasn't exactly sure about this. Okay. <clears throat> but I would just say that the franchise fee that's allowed to be collected by the franchising authority by the Cable Act is 5%. But an amount unspecified may be collected over and above that for capital purposes. And in Vermont, that number has been set 
at roughly half a percent, not roughly, half a percent. So when you say that's been <clears throat> set, so can you flesh that out a little bit? No, yeah, the, the Public Service Board, in based on precedent and then in Rule 8, said that 5% is the max for operating and half a percent is the guideline that we suggest for capital. So it's a guideline, it's not a it's not hard a, and it, fast. It's not hard and fast, and, but it's the number that most of the access centers collect. There are a couple that do not collect capital funds for reasons that are not clear to me. And then um, there may be, and Melissa or Dan would know this, communities where they may get slightly more than a half a percent. But as you can imagine, scale is really important. A half a percent in Burlington is going to be different than a half a percent in Hardware. So these um, capital, th these dollars are used to purchase equipment, and they're also used uh, in some cases to purchase technical assistance because increasingly in the old days you would just buy equipment for every technical issue you had but now they're software driven or they're technical assistance driven as opposed to well in addition to just simply buying a camera so you have to rent storage for example we didn't used to have to rent storage right when I say storage to put video files in a place so that you can retrieve them so you can watch them. So, forgive my ignorance, are we talking about on the cloud? Like what, yeah. when you, okay, so we're yeah. talking about. Or you might, you might purchase your own servers to store okay. your video. Okay. Or you might have a subscription <clears throat> service with Amazon okay. and pay them a monthly basis. So the nature of capital payments have made it during the digital transition have gone from being primarily hardware driven yeah. to a combination of um, hardware, software, subscriptions, technical assistance that enables access centers to produce, distribute, and store their content. Produce, transport, and store their content. Lauren, what's been the, uh, the increase in the, the uh, costs for your capital expenditures? Yeah, um, so equipment doesn't get cheaper just because it gets, there's a funny thing <laughs> in equipment. Um, cameras are not less expensive, and in fact, we've had to make the transition from SD, standard definition, to high definition, because that's the only equipment that's being sold now. So it, we're required to move our production and our transport into high definition. We don't have access to high definition channels, most of us. Some of us do, um, so those are down converted to standard definition. That's another story, but we're here now to talk about that. So um, we have, so, the, so there haven't been any price savings, and in fact, it, again, I can speak for Channel 17, the technical requirements for us to preserve our archives, which now are 35,000 programs, are incredibly expensive. And they, um, we have more digital content in our archives than anyone else in the state of Vermont, probably, in terms of video archives. I mean, it's, it's enormous. So the expertise needed to figure out how to handle that and the cost mm -hmm. of storage um, is, while well, the cost of storage is coming down, is a, is a big capital burden for us because we're holding this repository of right. community history in right. addition to delivering service all yeah. the time. That's a really good point. So I think that um, many of us are finding the technical needs to be quite challenging. Um, I mean, we're managing, but mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's expensive to so, maintain a television So channel. over the last 10 years, uh, has the cost doubled or tripled? Or? Well, I would say that for the past 10 years, the amount of money we receive for capital from the cable operators has not been sufficient to cover our capital expenses. And we have had to move money from the reserves to cover those expenses. Kim, are you getting to half percent? Or are you getting we have half less? percent, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, and it's, um, again, it's, the, have the cost risen by double, two, three, two or three times, or what? The size of our video storage needs have increased. Mm -hmm. The costs 
have been flat or gone down, but our requirements have gone up. Right. Because we're saving. We used to put it right. on a videotape yeah. and I'm sell the videotape back. The yeah. total expenditures for, for that. Right. So it has gone up. I would say it has gone up. Yeah. For, in our case, um, I could provide a more coherent answer related sure. for the whole movement. Right. Um, but the capital needs are a big concern, and how to maintain them is a question. I uh, saw so Karen and then Cliff. Do you do you keep everything? Do you have any sort of culling process, or do you keep every, all those thirty-five thousand mm -hmm. programs that you would ever need? Yeah. So we have, in our case, and again, I think we might be unusual in our archival practices. Not all the access centers have kept everything they've produced uh -huh. since the beginning of time, since 1984. So. Um, we have not kept the municipal meetings prior to when we went online in the mm -hmm. mid 2000s. We did not keep municipal meetings. Mm -hmm. So we had 15, 16 years of municipal meetings that we gave right. back to the municipality. So we don't have those in our archives. Mm -hmm. But once we went digital, <coughs> once we went online with our collection, everything is online. And we're in the process of digitizing mm -hmm. the collection from 84. To 2006. Hmm. So we have particularly intensive needs. Other access centers may not have those needs. Um, however, I think that the economies of scale don't necessarily accrue in, uh -huh. in our operations, right. technically. I mean, it just um, <coughs> what it comes to mind is when you were talking earlier about the situational value. I'm sitting here thinking about, so train is a historian. That's my wheelhouse. I'm thinking about the value of, of that archival footage to these towns and these communities. And that's a different kind of situational value long term. And again, like I find in, in, in chairing this committee, there are so many aspects of this I, I hadn't considered. So I really appreciate that. Clay? Uh, that just uh, raised two questions for me. Uh, you mentioned reserves, and I was curious right. to hear, and I'll also ask both questions at once, um, uh, what that means and, and where that revenue has come mm -hmm. from. And then the second question is, and this might be a question that gets answered on a different day, but in terms of, um, we have 22 or 25 AMOs, 25 AMOs, right? Um, to what extent do the AMOs share resources? You talk about archiving, is, there, uh, is that a, a shared effort, or are each AMO archiving on their own, mm -hmm. um, and then other resources, obviously. So a lot of questions there, I apologize. Do you want to say something about that? Shared resources? Yeah. Uh, uh, Hello. Thank you for coming up. Yeah. Uh, my name is Kevin Christopher. I'm the executive director of Lake Champlain Access TV in Colchester and the president of the Vermont Access Network. Um, I think uh, given our uh, physical proximity to each other, that's not always the easiest thing. Um, in Burlington, uh, VCAN or ITN have a co-located facility with facilities. And they are doing a lot of shared resources. Uh, they have a tech core there, which CCTV is part of that tech core as well. I don't know the extent of that. But, um, so there's a lot of shared um, storage there that I know of. Um, I don't know of any other example like that in the state. Mm -hmm. I know that we are, uh, there are discussions around that going on. Um, yeah, I, that helps a little bit. Yes, uh, we uh, built the tech core in Burlington as a hub that we hoped would position us to create a statewide archiving process. Mm -hmm. So we we have done a lot of our development work with an eye to statewide economies of scale. Um, I think the truth is is that each access center is somewhat anarchistic in its practices, and so to have everyone kind of get on the same page with mm -hmm. with archiving practices is is a a time, function of time more than technical need. And there are movements afoot. Uh, Vermont Access Network has an archiving committee right. that's kind of exploring best practices and the ways that we can. Uh, and is the state involved in any way? Like uh, the 
and other agencies devoted to historical preservation, Department of Libraries, things like that. Are there discussions? I know about? there's been outreach to other entities in the state. I can't speak to the specifics of that. Yeah. I, I would say we work informally and anecdotally with, with those entities because I think we're not quite at the point. We don't quite have the technical infrastructure to move ahead with a statewide archiving project. And that's what we're trying to position. And, yeah. What was your first question? Because I Reserves. Reserves. When you're spending money from the reserves yeah. to pay for capital expenses, how so, are you backfilling the reserves, or are you, or? You know, what is that made up of? Oh, right. Where are you getting that reserve funding from? Yeah. Yeah, during the Adelphia years, um, they, we had funding, in our case, we had a funding issue with them that ended up them compensating us in a lump sum for money they hadn't paid over several years. So we had a pretty substantial, in addition to our savings, we call it a reserve. So fund balance would be what a, typically a nonprofit would call. And so the best practice is to have three to six months of operating revenue in the bank. And the, the, we have been, we're now at about three months because we've been spending <coughs> to support our capital needs. So um, I think it's good practice for everyone to have reserves, but um, they range they, depending on the size of the organization and their your spending practices. So reserves, the reserve is specific to your AMO. It's not necessarily that uh, a resource that every AMO has. That's right. Okay. Right, Kevin. That's true. Yes, and we have the same situation that Lauren Land's organization did with Adelphia, uh, sort of a, a windfall of owed uh, okay. revenue. Uh, so we were able to build a reserve, and I think. Um, a lot of it is is uh, informed by our strategic plans in terms of what do we need to accomplish in terms of capital over the next five to ten years. So it's budgeting and spending around that, and then building up those funds to do an HD upgrade or a new playback server, something like that. Which I think I would just also say. It's important to know that the, it isn't just that we're buying one or two cameras a year. Periodically, we have to do massive capital upgrades. Sure. A playback system is a $30,000 investment. So mm -hmm. we're, we're similar to any tech intensive business. Right. right. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Are you that concludes my remarks. OK, great. Other questions for Lauren Glenn before we move on? I have a question. It's not directly related okay. to the capital funding, but I think it might um, be useful because it was based on something that you said earlier, um, which was other opportunities for funding. You mentioned fees for service contributions, underwriting, and then you talked about ways to leverage the value. And you talked about um, a statewide TV channel. And so this discussion of um, leveraging what other AMOs are doing um, just sort of moved in, moved my mind into you know how could these um, opportunities to provide this you know a statewide TV channel or Vermont interactive television um, how is that an opportunity to make to to find more funding potentially and. Um, you know, what value does that uh, relay to the state and to citizens overall and as a um, transition to, to uh, you know, budgeting and such. So I was just, I don't know if we have to move that on to another topic or if it's that's something that I'm still formulating or you kind of know where Why I'm coming from. You know, if it's okay, let's, these are great questions. Let's, let's park that. Okay. And at the end, we're going to set the agenda for, for the next week, I mean, the, yeah. the next meeting. And um, certainly we'll have you weigh in on what direction you should, we should go in regarding Andrea's question. Okay. So, That's um, great. So next is Dan Glanville, who's going to take us through fund trend lines. 
Great. Uh, thanks for welcoming me back. Uh, I similarly have six copies of this, so I wish they help me get three of this, so I will okay, share. Okay, you can share. Yep. And that's a, uh, a, a trending sheet uh, that basically shows where the trend of funding has gone. Now, for instance, when we entered uh, in 2006, our annual payments uh, remitted uh, exceeded just over $3.5 million. We've gone up every year since then. Uh, we did have some dips in 16 and a dip in 18, which I'll talk about. Uh, but primarily, you've seen an increase that has the fund uh, has doubled uh, since our entry into the market. Uh, some of the things that um, have caused uh, changes in funding, there could be a uh, change in capital funding, uh, which could have been implemented. Uh, and since I entered the market, we had about five of those where we implemented a capital payment. So as a result, it would have seen an increased uh, funding level. In addition, uh, sometimes when we have renewed an AMO agreement, we have changed a payment schedule to what might have been a non-traditional payment schedule to put it more consistently with how the rest of our payments go out to AMOs uh, so that it can be uh, easier uh, for us to uh, send payments. So that can, uh, in a given year, if something's done where a quarterly payment might have been made in that first year, could have adversely affected uh, the structure in that particular year. Uh, in addition, uh, a little over a year ago, we implemented uh, some changes to the generally accepted accounting practices, uh, which as a result of that did have an impact into the funding model. Uh, for that one year, uh, and uh, it will continue, but it will be static. Uh, but I think one thing that uh, I think should be stated is that uh, there's been a message or a, uh, a uh, thought process that as a result some of the funding is decreasing due to uh, decrease in cable revenues. Uh, we have seen some impact of uh, cord cutting, uh, but we think that we have made significant investment in uh, the cable services that we provide uh, since entering the market. Uh, the implementation and the change of uh, viewer-aided devices, which lead to the X1 implementation, we think has uh, actually increased, increased, in, increased interest in cable service. Uh, Comcast has continues to make uh, billion dollar investments into the infrastructure that we provide uh, to continue to compete effectively with over the top providers uh, and other providers. And we believe for the long term uh, that the viability of cable service will continue. Uh, can I just ask you yes. to say over the top providers? Uh, so it's Netflix. Know. Okay, great. Uh, I just want to make sure. Netflix and others. Yes, sorry, term of art. Yes, uh, yes. You're, uh, you're in it. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> pull back up a little bit. Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, but we do think that that reaction uh, and our investment has continued to uh, lead to the continued customer, consumer interest in cable service, and we believe we'll, we'll continue to do that. I mean, you have seen uh, some uh, over-the-top providers enter the market with great success and then fall off with subscriber numbers. Uh, and we do believe that ultimately we continue to make investment in that front. Uh, we continue to hopefully meet the demands of what our subscribers want and need for the provision of their cable service. Uh, and we ultimately believe that the 5% revenue uh, will continue to support uh, AMO providers in Vermont and across the country uh, for years to come. Clay? As Comcast, uh, given thought, or maybe this is a, an industry wide, I mean, you compete in video with, or as you say, over the top, Netflix, Hulu. Um, is Comcast moving in that direction as well? And how does it plan to treat uh, public access if it decides to go toward a video streaming platform? Well, even our, even all of the video products that we offer to date have been designated as a cable service, and we continue to pay the franchise fee on those services, even for a stream product. 
Uh, Can you say that again? Even for the stream product that we currently offer today. Oh, back up. <laughs> Just all your services yeah. are still classified. Still classified as cable services, meaning we pay the 5% fee well, on that. All your videos. Services. All of our video services, yes. So, not broadband. So not broadband. Broad so I, I, I said all of our cable services. I probably should have said all of our video services. Um, when I say cable services, I, it's, the, it's the legal term for it. But okay. Yeah, when I hear cable services, I think my cable bill is only paying for broadband, you know, like because I'm not, I don't have a TV, television video service. So it, it's interesting to me that even though I might listen to or view the, um, the AMO content through the internet via cable, that it's not charged that the 5% is not applied to that. Is that, is that correct? That's correct. So you're viewing it through your internet service purchased through Comcast, but not through a cable service purchased through Comcast. So it moves through the cable, right? It does. Okay. Yeah. So it's just, I, I know that this is all discussed on the federal level and already, you know, limited. No, it's but, really important to tease it out. From a practical standpoint, mm -hmm. it, you know, who I, Pay my bill to and such. You know? yes. It's not. I, I look at the Netflix bill, you know, as separate. But that vehicle comes through a cable. A cable. Yeah. And, and if you buy Netflix, you're not you're hey, paying five percent more if you want the Comcast product, which is a competitor. Well, but service. it's not the same product. Oh, we offer Netflix as an app on our X1 service, and we will we will bill for that and provide it to you. Oh, okay. So, yes. so if it were provided that way, then the five percent would apply. Okay. See, yeah, this really is, is this. Well, they're using the same infrastructure, yeah. but they're classified. They're running businesses that are classified differently under the Communications Act, right? Right. So you've got Title VI, which is the cable, and then you've got Title I, which is the information service, right? And Title I is not subject to the franchise fee. Got it. But Title VI is, even though it's essentially the same infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So that's why he's taking pains to use the right the terminology. Yeah. Terminology. Yeah. We're not trying to call you pain. No pain. No pain. So, so when you talk about the viability of uh, cable service uh, being ongoing, um, you're, you're not just talking about the uh, services provided through cable TV, but also the uh, broadband services that you're providing. Well, I'm talking about the video television service. Okay, so, yes. so what you're saying is you're going to continue to have enough subscribers to video television service. We absolutely believe that to be the case. So. And with the addition of something like Netflix, it makes it easier for some a customer to subscribe. Some, you know, in a way, I, and then that would actually keep the connection with the customer. Yeah, it's one spot, so yeah. it would be available on our apps. We have that. Uh, we have Amazon Prime uh, and others. It's interesting. So X1 is a cable service. X1 is a cable service. So do you work? Do you have a partnership with them? Is we that do. how that works? Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Did you have something else? Yeah. Uh, so another thing you said is that the uh, you had a, a change in general accepted counting practices. What that was in 2017. Implemented at the end, end of 2017 for impact in 2018. Why are like, all these meetings and years blend together quickly? Don't they? No, <laughs> okay. So um, you said that that decreased the um, the five percent uh, franchise fee for one year. Now. Is that uh, ongoing? Is that has that increased and it's going to stay at that level? Yeah, so the change, so the five percent remained the same. But yeah, what right. happened is how it was calculated and how we calculated our services as a result of how it would fit into that five percent was adjusted to meet gap. And as a result of that, going forward, that adjustment should not impact going forward. Does that make sense? So when you say it should not impact, does that mean that? It will no longer decrease, but not as a result of the same gap. level. Correct. It's going to stay at the same level. Well, as a result so of the gap, it will not cause a decrease. That decrease is going to be ongoing. Yeah, there are. I mean, 
Look, it's a, it's, a, it's a business that changes month to month, so there could be impact month to month, but something as a result of the gap impact would, was a one-time impact. But you, I'm oh, sorry. Was no, it supposed okay. to be revenue neutral, the, the shift in the gap practice? I guess I don't understand the question. No, no, no. Essentially, the, if I may, sure. you're, the Comcast accountants said there's been a change in gap classifications for all industries, and we have to make this change. Uh -huh. And that is going to result in a, in a um, reclassification of, of our revenue, how we define our revenue. So it meant that there was less revenue to put the 5% against. I see. And so there was this redefinition of revenue on the gap side, not on the state side. Okay. And there was a one-time drop of about a half a million dollars statewide in revenue franchise fee revenue. So that happened. Okay. So we've lost it. It's gone, but it's not going to keep going down because of that. Just so for us non-accountants, uh, what, what exactly changed in the accounting practices that resulted in this, this decrease? What is not being counted or? So it was an allocation and how it was allocated. Uh, so the percentage as to how a bill, which could have been a bundled bill, was allocated for a cable service, for the internet service, for the home service, or for the telephone service, and how those were specifically allocated within one bundled bill. Okay. So what is now subject to, to the 5% uh, franchise fee, and what that there wasn't what is not subject to five percent mm -hmm. franchise fee that Top was subject three. before? Nothing. <laughs> if, if, if it helps, if, it's how you, was it? I'm gonna try. I can explain it to me six times before. I <laughs> um, but uh, you pay your Comcast bill. Let's say it's hundred bucks, yeah. and you're buying telephone, internet, and right. cable TV. All of those things they sell separately. And I believe the rules change the way uh, you allocate the percentage. So it's not just 33%, 33%, 33%. Each item has a different value. And the way to calculate that value is to look at what do they sell that service for independently. And then they, they kind of fit that together in a, you know, well, because they're offering discounts on all of them to get you to buy all three. Um, how, what percentage? of that $100 can be counted as cable versus telephone versus internet. Right. That's what changed. But the percentage remains the same. So it's, yeah. it, sounds, mm -hmm. it sounds like I'm not, well, it sounds sense. like I'm speaking with forked tongue, but it's, that's, that's the. That's the <laughs> <laughs> I think you're projecting. <laughs> I think you're, you're, you're trying to help us understand some, some difficult concepts for some of us who are not in the business, so. But Dan, was there also a change in Broadcast fees. Well, how that was. Maybe not. I don't, I don't believe so. Okay. Yeah, I don't believe there was there was an impact regarding that. And also, just FYI, we had a workshop at the Public Utility Commission on this question, so we all got together and okay. got it sorted out, so we could understand. And we agreed that it would have been nice to have a little more advanced communication on it, but that was really the essential. And it could have been different. Okay. Was there a document that was generated from that meeting that we could refer to? It was um, case number 19-0367, and there was a, a final report issued by the hearing officer. Um, and there were documents related to it. We can. Just, I, yeah, we had submitted that. documents, and okay. I think there was there was. A, Several hours of testimony, also. Maybe not. Yeah, there's a yeah, transcript. The, and there's, well, uh, very long. If, if there is a document that was generated that you think that would be helpful for us to see, you can get that electronically to, to Mike Grant, who's overseeing the committees um, through the council, and he can post that for us to see. But, but so essentially, the end result was a reduction in. Um, Correct. Okay. Dan, thank you. I,
I just had one mm -hmm. suggestion. Um, that it, it, it is really helpful to see the information presented this way, but I think that the scale is off in a way that doesn't really do enough justice to the um, to, to witness the change in amounts. Um, because you know, for some of these um, AMOs, a small amount is a big deal, and so yeah, maybe if you could like squeeze in the dates, because I, I could see something like this going to a report. And it would be really helpful to have. Yeah, I don't disagree with you when I when I read it. So yeah. let us see if we can make that. Uh, uh, if we do do that, it actually it, it shows it shows more of a hockey stick. But uh, uh, we I think we we can do that. That would be great. Point well taken. Well, I think Thank if you. we take the um, the uh, y axis and the x axis and just move them together and make instead of 1.6 being the highest, you know, kind of whatever the highest actually is. And, it would just present the information a little bit better. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, paper's only so big. Yeah. Well, yeah, and if you, there are ways. We will, we will work on right. it with okay. people who are probably better at it than we are. OK. Yeah, I have one other question. Yes. OK. Um, in the first sheet that you handed out, this yes. was sale, um, in, 20, in, the, in the 2019 uh, column. Yes. That is about half of what was uh, allocated in 2018. And I'm wondering, is that a six month? Does that reflect six months or is that? I believe it's less than six months, but we will confirm that for the next meeting. Okay. I think it's a little more than first quarter, because okay. if it were just first quarter, we would have died. Uh, okay. Or we would have a big smile on. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay. What five months? About five months. Okay. So, if we could, I'd love to uh, move forward on franchise fees and video providers. Um, Dan, you said you had a fairly brief update on that. Yeah. So it have to be too brief, but yeah, I, I did a little research into this. There was Massachusetts implemented one on satellite providers uh, about four or five years ago. And uh, it's outside the scope of my expertise. So I did some review on it. I talked to some people on it. And I think the better way to go might be to have somebody come in and do an explanation for us for 15 or 20 minutes as to what that was and what some others might be, if that would be acceptable to the body. I think yeah, that would be helpful. Yeah. So, um, I can we'll, arrange we'll for talk, that. We'll yeah, we should try. I don't know if it'll be in our next meeting or if it would have to be in the one after that. A little more. Yeah. Yes. OK. OK. Mm -hmm. That's all I had. That's all you have. Okay, great. I just want to make sure I'm not, not cutting you off. Um, so Clay is going to um, give us an overview of the map of cable franchise towns. Sure. Uh, this can be a very quick item. Uh, and do we have um, a copy of that? It that is, actually is uh, yeah. on the... Great, just for the folks at home. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so this is a map that the department put together. Uh, we uh, look at all of the cable CPGs. As you know, cable companies uh, uh, receive a certificate of public good from the Public Utility Commission uh, to operate in specific towns. So if you looked at Comcast uh, uh, CPG, it would individually list every town in which they are authorized to do business. But they were out of town saying to come back to the Public Utility Commission to do that. Um, are, are we talking about uh, cable franchise areas or are we talking about the uh, AMOs? This, this is that the is the AMO map. This is the map I'm talking about. This is the map you're talking about. Okay. Yes. The, uh, Do we have this? This Vermont. is the only one. <laughs> That's the only map? Okay. Okay. Um, uh, just because a cable company is not or is franchised for a town doesn't mean that there are any cable services in that town. Um, we can also produce a map of where there's actual cable plants, you can see. But as Lauren Glenn um, mentioned earlier in the meeting, cable uh, service uh, passes about 65% of our state's buildings. So, and the plan, can, you, can you say that one more time? 
uh, cable service passes about 65% of the buildings in Vermont. So, okay. meaning it's available. Meaning it's available if, if uh, those homes, people in those homes want to buy it. Doesn't mean they have to buy it. Right. right? Um, and, but they could be connected. Right. And so are these, um, the pink is the Pink is nothing at all, but the, 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 there might be um, service, but not service to everyone, right? That's what you. That's what you're saying. Uh, in the pink, there is absolutely no, no cable service. because the cable companies do not have uh, the franchise, yeah, franchise to okay. operate in those in those towns. So you can see the Northeast Kingdom has none. Yeah. Uh, if you looked at, um, I don't pick on Brookfield. I like to pick on Brookfield. Um, I think there may be three homes in Brookfield that have cable okay. plant going by it. Um, it, it. Comcast is franchised to offer service right. in Brookfield. Doesn't mean they do, uh, Got it. or to the entire town. Mm -hmm. And so most towns are like that, uh, at least rural towns. Um, it, it, it doesn't mean that the town has 100% access to cable. It might have 60 or 30 or, uh, it depends. Um, uh, Comcast, you can see, is the largest um, followed by Charter, which is the second biggest. Um, some towns have two franchises. Um, it doesn't mean that they compete directly. Burlington's probably the only place where cable companies are, two cable companies are competing head to head for the same body of customers. And then um, you have this kind of other, there are several small uh, Cable uh, company Stowe, Duncan Cable, and Southern Vermont Cable come to mind as uh, and Thompson as well. As a, a few cable companies that are just very small. So that's all I have on this map. It just shows you um, kind of where cable companies uh, are. This map here um, was actually produced by Vermont Access Network. Um, and this just shows the territories in which the AMOs operate. So uh, AMOs uh, operate in several, uh, they can operate, I guess, in different uh, cable franchise territories. They can, um, they can share territories. Um, often they are split um, based on the communities they serve. So it just shows you where, where we have AMOs. And where we don't, so there are communities that aren't really served by the amount. Here's a tactile map version of you'd like to see the whole thing at once. Um, may, question. May I just, oh, yes. Uh, um, go ahead. Go ahead. You go. Uh, so, for instance, Shore, Shoreham and Barnwell, <coughs> uh, is there service from New York at all? Like on those border towns? Mm. Um, no, if a cable company wanted to build anything in those towns, they would have to come to the, um, the Public Facility Commission. If there is a cable company selling cable for, for money there, um, and, uh, they don't have a CPG, that, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, no, the, they probably are not receiving service from New York. Um, unless that company is going to go to the Public Utility Commission first. There are, I, th I believe there's one in the Northeast Kingdom that went out of business, so at one point there was cable service in Canaan, not any longer. So my question, I think, is for Dan. Um, so I know that, if, um, in particular in Charlotte, it's not entirely covered by, by Comcast, so um, there was a situation where a uh, community wanted to uh, get cable in, and uh, because of the, de the low density of the uh, uh, development there, uh, Comcast charged each resident that wanted to hook up a certain fee for putting that in. Um, is that um, construction fee or whatever it's called? Uh, hookup fee, is that, is that covered by the franchise? Is that one of the revenues of the cable company that is covered by the franchise fee? Oh, Melissa, do you know, would you include that in the franchise fee? Um, I think it's direct payment for services yeah, rendered. Yeah, so. it's not a of service. 
Yeah. Melissa, what's your last name? Pierce, P-I-E-R-C-E. -E. Thank you. I'm sorry, Melissa Pierce is our manager of government affairs on, on my team here in Vermont. I don't believe it is. It's a good question. I don't, I don't believe it is. They're, they're, they're very rare that they occur. Yeah. Uh, because oftentimes, so uh, the, the national average is about 25 homes pass per mile. That used to be the level for construction to be built. Uh, We've gone as low as 8, 9, and 10 here in Vermont in some areas. So what remains is probably very low density. So as a result, has a uh, very high cost per mile, and as a result, a very uh, long uh, return on investment model. Uh, and oftentimes, when there would be one, two, or three houses that are interested, uh, they, would have, they would probably have very low density. So as a result, the price for construction that could be presented to them would be very high. So it would be unlikely that uh, many of the residents would, would want to do that. We have had some very successful partnerships with the state on the public-private partnership route in the past uh, five to seven years. Uh, uh, where we, one of those is that one that we just inked last week was with uh, Catholic Vermont, so we'll be doing some extension there. In an area that traditionally didn't meet requirements for build out. Uh, so knock on wood, hopefully there might be some more of that if there is an infrastructure package out of, of Washington that could meet the needs of some very rural construction. We had a very successful project that we did with uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts as well through the Mass Broadband Institute. We were able to do some densities as low as uh, eight to 10 homes past per mile. So that was a long-winded answer, but kind of wanted to give a general flavor for how plans is extended. And, and Dan, I don't hear you mentioned the tariff, you have a tariff on line extension. Yeah, so specific line extension tariff that we abide by on how we have to, what, uh, at, what, at what level we would have to build. Uh, and at what level we can then charge uh, for a build, uh, so we comply with that, and then we report back on an annual basis what, what is built. But those build-out fees are not included in the uh, revenue estate you count toward the franchise? I don't believe so. Okay. I don't believe so. That's my question. We might have more to report at our next meeting on build-out. Right. Okay. Questions? Clarifications? Anything else you wanted to add? Dan? That is all I have at this time. Thank okay. you. So I want to check in with the check in with the committee here. Do, do folks need a break to stretch, get a drink, use the bathroom, or should we move on? Keep going. I wasn't disinterested. I had to send a quick text to somebody that I, I missed a call, so I apologize oh. if someone saw me text. No, that's all right. All right, so I believe next up we are talking with our legislative council, Maria Royal, who's going to come up. So Yes, we can. Karen, if you don't mind moving your microphone over. Maria Royal, who's with our Legislative Council here at the State House, who's going to talk to us about the proposed FCC report order that came down recently. Good morning, Maria. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Almost afternoon. Yes. Um, happy to be here. Uh, yes, Maria Royal with Legislative Council. Um, so you have heard about a couple of issues that are impacting the funding for PEG access, change in accounting practices, um, I think you've heard about kind of decline in cable service, cable television service revenue generally. I think that's happening nationwide, if I'm not mistaken. Um, also some increases in capital costs, whether it's the archiving technology or software. So what I'm going to be talking about are some changes, um, proposed changes at the federal level, specifically through the FCC that impact uh, funding that's available. So. Um, the FCC has a very uh, extensive history um, dealing with rules and challenges to rules about specifically the franchise fee, which as you know is capped at 5%, what's included in that fee. Um, uh, so extensive that it goes back to at least 2007. Um, and at that time, the FCC issued two orders, uh, basically saying that cable operators could deduct from the 5% fee any cable-related in-kind contributions. 
Um, so that might include something like free or discounted service to public buildings, cable service to public buildings. Um, that those expenses could be deducted um, from the total amount of money that's available uh, over and above that. So that issue, um, there were some petitions to uh, reconsider, and I'm limiting myself. The, the orders did include m other, other subjects. Things. Yes, and so, absolutely. So I'm just talking about the fee. And so, and you said, so 2007, two orders. And there were two orders. One, and yeah. do you want to tell us what the second one, well, or do you want to? Uh, how do you want uh, to? The second one, basically, I think just. Uh, uh, explain that the, the rules in the first order would apply to incumbents and not just new entrants. And okay. I think for purposes of this discussion, yep. that's maybe not quite as relevant. Okay. But, but I think that's why there were the two orders. The yep. first order was challenged um, in court, but those peti petitions were denied. The second order um, was uh, challenged. There were motions um, for reconsideration filed as early as there were three as three is in early 2008, um, but the SCC did not issue a reconsideration order until 2015. So a lot of time has elapsed um, just to get to the reconsideration order. Mm -hmm. But um, in short, and I'm summarizing a lot of information, uh, basically the FCC in 2015 reaffirmed that cable-related in-kind contributions can be deducted from the 5%. That order um, was uh, appealed, and there was a Sixth Circuit opinion, both the most recent FCC order, which I haven't talked about yet, and the Sixth Circuit opinion are online on the web page, should you okay. desire to read them. Mm -hmm. um, and basically, the uh, court said that the FCC uh, failed to adequately explain the scope of the in-kind contribution. What does it mean? And the reason why I'm giving you all this background is, is because that gets us closer to today and the issues of today. Um, so in 2018, last fall, the FCC issued a notice of final proposed rulemaking where it greatly elaborated on what constitutes an in-kind contribution. Um, and just recently on July 11th, uh, issued a proposed final order which has not yet been adopted but is likely to be adopted in August. So um, that sort of quickly covers a lot of history, and this is, I think, typical for the communications industry that there is a lot of back and forth, and there's a lot of litigation and a lot of jurisdictional issues, and they're constantly evolving and playing out in the courts, in the FCC, and then the states are responding. So what? Um, um, yes. Question, mm -hmm. um, when the uh, in terms of deducting from the franchise fee in kind contributions, are they is that deducted um, before the franchise fee is assessed, or is that a deduction from the if, if the five percent is calculated based on revenues and then the in kind contributions are deducted after that? Right. I, I'll defer <laughs> to. You. Um, yeah. I mean, that's part of the gen the, the cable company to the department to guess, you know, like, kind of flesh it out a little bit more how it actually takes place on the ground. That's helpful. Yeah. So is that after after the fact deduction? Uh, yeah, we don't have any in kind deductions that take place today. Oh, okay. So okay. have they been estimated? No estimates. Uh, and I should just mention that the in kind does happen though. Like there are in kind. Contributions that Correct. are made, but yes. they just haven't been deducted. And they, have they been monetized, or are they monetized? To uh, we have not done it. So monetized in the sense that if you looked at an individual in-kind uh, grant, you could determine what the value is. But monetized from the sense of what how it would impact the uh, five percent payment in a particular franchise area. No. 
So, for instance, free service, free video service to a particular school that might have been required in a franchise in Western Massachusetts, we can say what that value would be, but whether or not what its impact would be on franchise, the franchise fees has not been determined. And is it voluntary for the company for to to make these changes to, to deduct from the fee? the income contributions as it's written now? I think it would be subject to the order, which my understanding is that it would not be voluntary, but uh, I would have to defer to, I haven't, I haven't done a full review of what came out last week. Okay, so that's all. Thank you. Thank you. That doesn't happen in Vermont. That not, yeah, that's, right. what's, that, that's what's up in flux, right? Yeah. The whole so and the, as the proposed rule reads now, just for some clarification, Cable operators would be permitted to deduct from permitted, percent. permitted to, not required to. I'm sure they they wouldn't have to if they didn't want to, but I presumably yeah. I'm just curious what the wording was. Negotiation, okay, bargaining for use of the right of way is percent, right? And but it is clear that the rule would be applied prospectively, so that there would be no going right. back to okay. try to recoup okay. any. Okay. Past funds. So um, the other kind of issue that's looked at is, um, and you've heard mention of this, uh, the capital costs that are over and above mm -hmm. the fee. Um, the FCC made clear that both construction-related and non-construction-related contributions um, can be included in capital these, these capital costs. <coughs> So you could have things um, such as obviously a construction of Peg Studios, um, but programming equipment such as cameras, potentially the archive software that's required. Um, would or would not be allowed? Would be included in capital costs that are not subject to the 5% cap. Okay. In other words, they wouldn't be subtracted from the franchise fee. They're exempt. So there's the franchise fee up to 5% and then there's the capital. Right. And so what the FCC is saying, here's what we consider to be capital and that is safe. It, in other words, it cannot be subtracted from the 5%. These costs that we define as capital cannot be subtracted from the franchise fee. If they're provided in kind or if just no. period. Oh, no. yep. sorry. So but thank you. You're doing a much better job of explaining. No, it's just that. it's layers of onion. So there's Great. the franchise fee and then there's the capital. Great. Which That's are two the, things that the cable act up said. Up to half a percent, right? Thank well you. in Vermont up to half a percent, but to no cap. So the concern was can these capital expenses also be deducted from this franchise fee? And the FCSA says no, capital cannot be and this is how we define capital. It includes these things, like equipment or construction. Uh, construction costs? Yep, Con construction and non-construction like equipment. And transport, which but is getting the programming from the studio to the cable. Right. Head end, I think is what they call it. But so, so what the real question was, from the PEG standpoint, was what could be subtracted from this franchise fee? One of the questions that was on the table was the cost of channels. And this was on the table. And the FCC has taken that off the table. They said this is, we don't have enough information to know about this question. So channels cannot be subtracted from the franchise fee. For now. Right. right. Yeah, you're absolutely right. They said that the record was not complete to determine whether they should be channel capacity should offset the 5%, and if it does, how do you value channel capacity? Mm -hmm. So right now, the FCC says the status quo remains, which is that that capacity is not valued and used to offset, um, but will likely be looked at further. And can you say what examples, examples of what could be subtracted from the franchise fee? Did the, FCC define what those are. Is it like courtesy internet service or courtesy cable service or? I, that's, I'd have to look more, okay. more closely. I mean, uh, the um, 
proposed order is about 57 pages, yes, and important. they may very well have been more specific. I think the one example that I kind of noted was, you know, free or discounted, discounted service mm -hmm. to public facilities, but whether there are other in-kind And there to be values at market value. Fair enough, the value. I believe so. I think that tended to be how, yes, how they're going to value things. Whether that creates some complexity or difficulty, mm -hmm. for example, channel capacity or not, I think that's part of the problem. Is it that accurate and how is that determined? Who determines that? Mm -hmm. And how can it be reviewed? Um, yeah. I need to back way up. What, what's channel capacity? Do you want to speak to that? Channels. Capacity, just channels. So like channels, the number of channels, channels that you have. Right, so the, so the, the threat was that okay. we would have to pay for Channel 17. Oh, I see. Just for half only. Just for having it. access to it. Okay. Like, as if it, right, it wasn't clear. That, yeah. There was so much lack of clarity that I think they made the right ruling. It was like, what, what are you charging for? And how much would it be? And okay. this could kill us, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, okay. we didn't know if we just assumed. So then what's also in the order that I think um, will directly relate to some of the issues that you're considering in terms of possible other sources of revenue, um, the FCC did go on. It was very specific about um, kind of with respect to its preemption authority, what the local franchising authorities can and cannot do in terms of collecting additional revenue, whether it's on cable service or whether it's on non-cable service, such as internet access or telecommunications access, like VoIP. Um, and I think what's um, most interesting here uh, is that you know, the FCC was very clear that its ruling was confined to the franchise fee and the use of the right of way, this bargain. You can use the right of way, we're going to charge you. Um, but then said that the states uh, do have, through its traditional police powers, the ability to enact, um, to tax, to have broad based taxes, revenue raising taxes. Um, but it's not entirely clear whenever you're talking about economic burdens on communications providers, at what point are you running into conflict with the FCC's policy of non-regulation, of not imposing economic burdens on um, the internet or other communication services. So there, there's a competitive market and it's a thriving, and if you are gonna, um, kind of have broad-based taxes or with fees for the use of right-of-way, doing so in a non-discriminatory, competitively neutral way. So for example, if you look at taxing the right-of-way, uh, within the right-of-way, uh, the state wouldn't want to be duplicative if you're already taxing cable services. Um, but also you might want to consider, well, we might be capturing this group of communications providers that has facilities in the right-of-way but are we capturing the satellite providers? And so this ability in the state's jurisdiction to, to regulate and, uh, you know, other than just an income tax or corporate tax, you know, really broad, you're gonna get into these very specific issues of making sure that the entire industry is kind of treated fairly or mm -hmm. neutrally. Right? So universal service fee and USF charge fall under the taxation authority? Uh, uh, so the FCC talked mo mostly about the local franchising authority's ability to tax, but it was broader in terms of saying, well, the states do have their traditional police powers. But yes, so the, the USF, the universal service state USF, does fall within the state's general authority to raise revenue. Um, the scope of the universal service, but right now it's on telecommunications, right? It's so separate from cable television service. So this would be your, your telephone bill that you pay a flat 2% fee. 
So if the USF applies to Title II, which is telecommunication services, which are more like common carriers, mm -hmm. right? Cable is regulated, Title VI, more like a publisher. Right. Sort of not a common carrier. So USF is on the, on the right. traditional so, like the phone business. So does Title, Title VI uh, prohibit the use of something similar to USF? Well, one. Yeah, Title VI is equivalent to USF, is this franchise fee. So the common okay. good, the public benefit, like each one of these right, okay. titles have a public so, benefit. But uh, okay, so, internet, so Title VI pertains to cable. Cable, right. video services. Video where services. does the internet fall in that? Title I. Title I. Which is an information service. Correct. Okay. And it's, um, it doesn't have a comparable public benefit. Um, condition like the USF or franchise fee, which is kind of interesting, but okay. it's in, you know it's it's considered. It, 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 this might actually be this is a digression, but actually helpful because I didn't know about this really till yesterday. I was trying to figure it out. So there were proceedings in the FCC called the computer inquiries, inquiries. and they said there are two kinds of services. There are basic services and enhanced services. Basic service is kind of like telephone, you know, just the, the line with no content on it, just the fact that it's, and the, the enhanced is um, software going over the line, right, like valuable content on the line. And so they made this distinction between basic and enhanced. And that distinction has made its way into this Title I and Title II. So Title I is the basic. It's just the carrier. And Title II, I mean, Sorry, Title II is the basic, the common carrier. And Title I is this information service. It's, it's got content on it. It's a, it's, and the people, the companies that send it are more like publishers than they are like just the common carrier operator. So they have kind of First Amendment rights that accrue. There, you know, there's a bunch of stuff that goes with that Title I. And so the internet, it was decided, it's gone back and forth. Is the internet just a pipe, or is the internet an information service? Mm -hmm. And that's what this debate back and forth. So most recently, when the net neutrality rules were um, taken back, the, the, the internet was moved, remained a Title I information service. And the people, the companies that control it are more like publishers than telephone companies. To be clear, in access to the internet. So, in, internet access services or broadband internet access That's services. That's the proper name. But there's also a federal law that prohibits the taxation of uh, internet access services as well. So, there's a. So, there could be, there, there can't be a USF or a franchise fee. Right. The, the, on well, I have to, I have to study the, the, well, on internet access services. So, there are other. Title I services. Uh, Lauren Glenn mentioned the, uh, the computer inquiries. What the FCC was really trying to do was not regulate IBM. They didn't want to uh, regulate these huge multi-room computer systems that IBM was creating in the 60s. Mm -hmm. um, they wanted to stay away from it. That's why they, they did that. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the federal law that prohibits the, the taxation of internet access services is just that. It's a simple, a very straightforward law. That the Internet Tax Freedom Act? Yes, the Freedom from Taxation Act. Or I might be confusing that with another. Well, there's the Internet. There's the Internet Tax Freedom Act is the one you're talking about. Okay. Versus the Internet Freedom Act, which is the net neutrality <laughs> yeah, Oh, yeah. The, the, well, the yeah. Story. There are, I think, a half a dozen laws that yeah, free the internet. Of, <laughs> of of yeah. Yeah. Okay. And the franchise fee and the um, <coughs> the franchise fee is considered a tax in that thing. Is that? Uh, it's a fee on cable service. Well, and then it, it could there be a franchise fee on? Or some is that considered to be a tax though? Like it, 
I would look for Maria in that question. It, uh, it depends what it's used for. I mean, there's a whole body of case law on the difference between a tax and a fee. So it depends what, is it general revenue raising, then it's more like a tax. Is it a fee commensurate with regulatory authority or use? You know, so it would depend. So is there any way to, like, one thing that Lauren Glenn just said was there's no public benefit condition on the Title I services. Is there any way to add that without, or would you have to be, like, how to, how to fund that? Or would that be considered, any way doing that, any way you do that, would that consider, be considered a tax? I think that's going to be an issue of, you know, the, the FCC's definitions mm -hmm. and determining what the policy is with respect to the inter the internet and broadband. And right now it's a policy of non-regulation. Okay. <laughs> and there are challenges. I mean, all of this is being litigated. And there are challenges about, you know, is is that has the FCC gone too far in preempting state authority to exercise its traditional police powers in the interests of the public welfare? You know, is is internet more like a utility? What is it used for? You know, and, and should there be I mean, these are all major policy issues, and they're all being litigated. Um, so there, are there other states that have implemented something that's in litigation now? or Well, the order itself has been challenged, the FCC's okay. Restoring Internet Freedom Order, um, where it reclassified broadband internet access as an information service to be free of federal or state regulation okay. um, and then there's a separate federal act um, that prohibits states from taxing the internet so there are a couple of uh, okay. federal laws but that FCC order has been challenged including by Vermont I think there are 22 state okay. attorney generals who have challenged the order on numerous grounds both procedural and substantive um, and I we don't know the status of that. Mm -hmm. So whether we're talking about telephone, cable, video, <clears throat> video, uh, internet, um, those are all services, and they're governed by these different titles by yeah. the FCC. And what, regardless of what type of service is being provided, every service requires a infrastructure, whether it's uh, cable lines, fiber optic cable, uh, satellite, or anything else. Can a distinction be made legally between the authority to attack, attack, uh, to attack services versus the authority to tax infrastructure? Uh, you can make a distinction. But what the authority is, is going to vary based on the service. So if it's an information service, like internet access, then the state's authority is very limited, right? So can you, can you look at the infrastructure as being, regardless of what the service is being provided, as, as something that, that can in itself be taxed. For instance, a utility pole. For instance, the wire. For instance, the satellite dish. Well, uh, our personal property is taxed uh, in all the jurisdictions that we have. So it's a personal property assessment for the wires, for the electronics, that's taxed at the local level across the country as well. You, you pay generally applicable taxes. Yes. Was there something else, Mike, that you were trying to tease out? No, I'm just going down that particular path of thought. Yeah. Maria, what else do we need to know? I know we'll need to know a lot. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, you're having a discussion about what is the impact on current revenue, right? what's going to happen. Right. Do you want to do the policy matter? 
find additional revenue. Or... So. so, so actually, so it sounds like there are certain avenues that are basically closed to us in terms of looking. I think there are there are some that are closed. There's some that's just not clear, right? And you know that it might not be clear, and it's just you know a, a lot of it. I mean, I I can spend months like really trying to understand and come up with different arguments for doing things. Whether you actually, you know, if you do something that's in a gray area, is that going to be challenged? And then are you going to right? You know, so I think yes. there's always that risk, unless it's absolutely right. you know with certainty. Okay, well this we can do. So I think there are a few ideas that have come up that are worth worthy of us just looking into yeah. more. Um, one of the things that we've talked about was the poll, poll, poll related fees, like fees that you can attach to the owners of the polls or the users of the polls. So there's a that's one area. Um, the, the agency of transportation right of way rental. So I talked to the agency about that a little bit. Um, so there's that's worth us looking at a little bit more. I mean, these may, may be foreclosed to us within 15 minutes of talking about them, but I think they're useful to know about because they're all relevant to this discussion of the state's authority over its rights of way and mm -hmm. what we can and cannot do would be a good thing to, for us to all know by mm -hmm. the end of this process. USF, there's policy implications. And Maria and I were talking about that a little bit, about whether you would add a fee to USF. But USF really isn't, so it's worth thinking about, but it's not strictly this t title, right? Um, so anyway, there are a few items there that just be worth us knowing a little bit more about to see if there's fees or rental or taxes. Mm -hmm. And then there's the road that you've gone down before, which are the cloud tax and, um, you know, which have, which you know about because you've already been through it, so you already know what the pros and cons are. It might just be actually good to sure. um, <coughs> update us on whether that's even viable as a way forward. And I mean, again, I'm not advocating for No, 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 we just, just need to, everything has table. to be on the table. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that we can, we have to gather the information in yeah. order for us to be able to sift through. And then the other thing I would say, in response to what you raised before, um, Vermont Interactive TV, you know, since it was closed, has been, you know, there was a committee on it. Mm -hmm. We wrote a, um, a dissenting report on how to actually revive it using the access centers. Mm -hmm. So there's been discussion about how this resource might be revived and that the infrastructure of the PEG AMOs in the state of Vermont could be used to serve that purpose mm -hmm. and um, in a cost-effective <coughs> way, what would be necessary. So, you know, that's not strictly a, oh, is there an alternative to the franchise fee? Right. But it's, oh, is there a partnership that actually would serve the state's requirements and utilize this infrastructure? Because I think that's another question in front of us. We have this resource. Could we be doing other things with it that we haven't thought about? It, do we still have that resource? Is, has it been repurposed? Those when I say the sites, this resource, I mean the PEG infrastructure. Not that the VIT is gone. It's gone, right? right. right. All that yeah. it's, gone. it's all gone. Yeah. It does. It's. But to have two-way interactive meetings <laughs> is not impossible to recreate. I mean, it can be done with a small piece of equipment like that, or right. it can be done in the studio facilities of the access centers. Yeah. And having a proper budget mm -hmm. could make that happen. So that might be something. We, so we could talk more about that. So we have about 12 minutes left, and Lauren Glenn, you did a great job just now of bringing up some topics that we need to get some more information on. I'm wondering what else. I want to circle back around, Andrea, to your questions earlier, and other things that are bubbling up in people's mind that we need more information on, witnesses that we want to come in, 
Um, certainly you're not going to be limited by this brainstorm session. We can certainly continue um, emailing after this meeting to get the agenda topic um, topics for next time. I want to be sure to tell the folks who are watching on ORCA that if you want to come testify, we're going to be starting each of our meetings with um, 15 or 20 minutes of um, public comment. And our the information about our meetings are posted on the legislative website. So what other topics are on your minds that we need to get down on paper so that we can figure out the next couple meetings? Um, I'd actually like to hear a little bit more about um, AMO governance and um, how AMOs operate and how they decide to, um, how they make decisions about spending their money. Um, it's not, we don't actually regulate AMOs, so it's not something that we necessarily look at. Okay. So I'd be curious to see how, um, how they, uh, the revenues that they receive are spent. Maybe in that discussion, uh, one or two reviews of an annual budget. Mm -hmm. And maybe also how coordination occurs with the animals, if, if it does. Yes, that's important. Just like examples of resource sharing and. Yeah. Okay. Um, and Maria, you should feel free as our legal counsel to weigh in on topics that you think have come up in this discussion today that we should perhaps delve into a little bit more. And we might, uh, the, the three of us will keep you informed, we might be better positioned at our next meeting to give an update on uh, the CPG process. Okay. For Comcast. Correct. Yeah. For Comcast. Is that what you said? Yes. Okay. Yeah, the appeal. Yeah. So I think um, probably the best way to handle some of these questions would be to invite some witnesses. Yeah, absolutely. Great. So, yeah. And um, those of you, there are several of you at the table that probably have in mind who some of those individuals are and should feel free. No need to say it now. We can talk um, afterwards about who we should invite, who we want to hear from. Um, Andrea, do you feel like there are bits of what you mentioned earlier that, that are not represented in this list that we should. Um, I guess, uh, I don't know how to have this play out, but sort of what are the, what are our actual options? I know, you know, mm -hmm. the, the legislative direction is consider alternative regulatory and funding mechanisms, but a brainstorm of, you know, what what could these actually be? Right, do we have any? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, that's sort of what I'm, yeah. I'm like, and that, that's where Maria's gonna be critical to say. Right. Like this, like, there's you can't, actually, actually, you can't actually do that. Yeah. And so I think that would be um, really useful for all of us. What are our actual options going forward? And so that we can really focus on those options and not get sidetracked yeah. on things that just and I think aren't. the sooner that we could do that, okay, the better, you know? So yeah. that the next meeting would be... Yeah, be and I think the Lauren Glenn's list yeah. um, sort of goes to that question yeah. as well. Yeah. It's like, let's, even if it's a few minutes of having someone come in and say, you know, here's the background, you can or can't do this, and then we'll, we'll be able to call through. Um, well, I wonder if Green Mountain Power, is, is there any value in having Green Mountain Power come in on the poll? Mm -hmm. attachments or is that more a utility person should talk about the poll? The utilities yes. are generally owned by uh, yeah. generally yeah. the polls, right? Right. Yeah, they own all the polls. Yeah. Well, uh, either well, there's a change going through with some yeah. of the ownership, but we don't. The, the providers, kind of cable providers, right. don't own any polls. Right. In fact, you were ready to be on the polls. Okay. And some of that is in flux now. In front of the commission, or yes. not in flux, but in being decided. There, there's a lot of poll yeah. stuff yeah. going yeah. on. Yeah. There's a, I, I, I'm uh, 21 years in the industry. Every year uh, we've been talking about polls. Okay. <laughs> there's a, j just as a quick summary, um, a proceeding uh, about how we calculate the poll rental fee. There is a proceeding about how companies can get uh, attached to polls. 
And then there is the cold sale bucket that um, Dan mentioned that's uh, consolidated selling its polls to GMP, which is, I think, a, we can all agree a good thing. If you live near a blue pole, for instance. If, if they're in that territory, like if a pole is in a GMP territory? Yes. Most, most of their polls they actually own jointly, and so it's a matter of transferring the pole ownership to, to GMP. And so to um, Lauren Glenn's question, do you think clay would be of use to have? You may want to exhaust all of the other avenues before you go down the pole, because we're going to have we're going to need a new legislation to okay. make this a decade long. Okay. Um, I wouldn't touch poles unless you absolutely have to. Okay. Um, Is it worth asking how many poles there are? What's that? Is it worth asking how many poles there are? Uh, I want to say like two, two fifty, maybe two fifty thousand. Two hundred fifty thousand. Yeah, I'd have to get you an exact number. There are there are many poles. <laughs> there Some are cool when they're done. They need to be removed. So. <laughs> all kinds of pole issues. So that moves down on the priority list. Right. Exactly. And did you want it? Did you still think it was a good idea to have Peter Blum come and talk about the internet tax? Uh, you could certainly bring him in to get his perspective. Because he's looked at that. I mean, yeah. it would be good for us to understand the, what it, the history and what it mm -hmm. allows us Absolutely. to do, and yes. if there are any asterisks. Sure. There might be. Yes. Mm -hmm. no, I'm happy to reach out to him. And then the, um, I think I was I was going to talk with Maria just a little bit more about what the agency of transportation guy said to see if it makes sense to bring him in. So he was talking about this rental, right of way rental, um, but it it isn't. I, I just need a little bit more okay. conversation with Maria in sure. order to recommend whether that's a way forward. That's okay. Just to sort through what he said. He's, you know, there's a chief of right of ways. No. We have, there's a chief of right of ways, and I talked to him. Ooh, Robert White. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. He has no idea how excited I was that there was someone with that job. <laughs> anyway. um, and then the USF fund, again, I'm not sure if it's a non starter given right. what it actually regulates. So. And I, yeah, and some of these things might be dispensed pretty quickly, but for us to just feel like we have checked the box, like can't go down that road, so that we feel like we've done due diligence, I think would be, would be helpful. Yeah. Maria, other things that you're, or Karen, did I see your hand? No, you didn't. I did not. I was like, no, actually, just scratching my cheeks. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, so thanks to everyone. I know we're all really busy. This is a very important topic for so many Vermonters. I appreciate your, your time and energy to this. And so once again, if you are interested in testifying public comment, please um, let us know and we'll schedule you for one of our uh, next meetings. Senator, can we reconfirm that this meeting? Yes, I'm about to do Thank that. You, you are seeing my thought bubble. What I've got is August 22nd, Thursday, uh, same time, 10 to 12.30, here at the State House in Montpelier. So the ballot, you want me to send that as a meeting invite to the committee, so it puts it up on people's Outlook calendars? That would be great. And then you there you. on August 22nd here? Yes, please. Yes, please. Okay. Yes, Special thanks to Mike Ferrant yes. and to Maria Royal and to our counsel from JFO who's here. Thank you very much for your time. You. Very much appreciated. Thank you. Okay, thank you.